So I wanted to start just by telling a little bit about what we do, a little bit more about what we do in my, in my lab. Uh, Neil, again, nicely set me up there. So that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so about half of what we do is really focused on what you could, you could collapse into normal cognition um, and really normal cognition for understanding how we navigate um, our surroundings and how we get oriented in space. Now, lots of people are studying that. What we're studying in that within that field really is, is, is how you use landmarks to, to do that, to accomplish that ability. And the role, um, probably what we're most known for is the role frames of reference play um, in making use of landmarks to navigate our surroundings. So what I mean by that is the way you view the world in front of you is very much body-centered or egocentric or person-centered. There's lots of terms for, for, for that reference frame that you could really collapse into a a word I'll use a few times today, egocentric or self-centered, basically. Um, and then the other reference frame that's very relevant for navigation is, is known as an allocentric reference frame. A, a better, simpler way to put that would be to say world-centered or map-like. And so navigation involves accessing both of those things. And we've become very interested in how you get between those two um, ways to look at the world or ways to view the world. Um, and um, I usually pause somewhere along here and give just kind of an analogy or description um, to kind of make more concrete some of the, what I'm talking about when we say we're interested in these things. Um, so one way to think of it is um, a way I often thought of things when I was living in Chicago where I rode the subway oftentimes. And if you're doing that, you might uh, get pretty familiar with the city and what different parts of the city looks like, look like. Some of those big buildings and landmarks you get familiar with and learn where they are learn their position with respect to each other. Um, and then you might be riding that subway and decide to get off at a new stop or a new slightly different place in town. And you, you might have that moment where you're coming up and out of that subway tunnel and you're taking in your surroundings and it clicks for you at some point where you are in the city and with, in relation to those landmarks, for example. So doing that involves, as you probably caught on to already, some learning and memory, right? You have to have learned and remembered where those things are. and involves what I was just telling you about too. When you come out of that tunnel, you're viewing what's in front of you in very much person-centered coordinates. You're seeing a landmark on your right, a different one over on your left, different one straight ahead maybe. And so you're, you're taking in that information and person-centered um, framework and what you maybe aren't even entirely aware of. Some of us navigate very much this way and others probably Kind of let this happen behind the scenes but for as far as we can tell for pretty much everybody there's parts of your brain that are always mapping out the positions of those things in your environment and very much gps like or map like coordinates so there's there's this reference frame behind the scenes happening as well and so we've really studied how those things happen within this comp context of this brain network i've drawn out as a bunch of boxes over here on the right um which we refer to as the parietal hippocampal network. Obviously you could call it by a few different names. It's just the one that tells you a lot where we, we spend a lot of our time in these two brain structures. And so down at the bottom here, these blue brain structures are the ones I was mentioning that are really mapping out where you are in the environment um, and very much GPS-like or map-like coordinates. Um, and then, as I mentioned also, the way you interface with the world, when you take in sensory information, that's very much egocentric or body-centered. That's the way you execute movements to your environment. You're going to turn right, you're going to move forward. So again, those movements are very much body-centered. And then what's pretty interesting is you've got some brain regions that are kind of sitting in between the map-like ones and the egocentric ones that are have a mixture of those reference frames. And those, we think, are probably important for getting between those two reference frames. So taking in a landmark on your right and connecting it to that map you have of your environment, for example. And, that, and what I've done here is just color coded those different brain regions from red being more egocentric to blue being more map-like. Okay, so these are some of the things we're interested in, how they're working normally, how they're working when you're spaced out in your car and you stop at an intersection, you have that moment when you come to and you immediately know where you are on your route home. So how those things are happening. And then we're just as interested in, um, and we spent about half of our time looking at what goes wrong with those same brain systems and those same abilities in the context of disease and disorder. Um, we've really looked at a couple in, in my lab. One of those is looking, and, and these, these things really cover really your, your entire lifespan. So we look very early at what stress early in life does to the system. And then what I'm gonna talk about today where we spent most of our disease work and time looking, is looking at what goes wrong with these same brain systems and abilities in the context of Alzheimer's disease. 
where you often find that, um, where you very early on find you have trouble navigating your surroundings. Okay, so I'm gonna give you one more description um, or more concrete example. I'm gonna come back to a couple of times in my talk before I jump into some of the more details here. And that is this idea, this is something I experienced when I moved to Tallahassee, right? Where I would find myself often sitting at this particular intersection, Stadium Drive, where it hits Tennessee. And I'd have to make a choice about going right or left or straight. And when I was learning the city and learning the map, I'd have to think back, back to the, my knowledge of where things are in the city to make that choice, to turn left to go get my car fixed, uh, to turn versus turning right um, to go home, for example. Okay, and that ability involves accessing that map, mental map of the environment and turning it into the appropriate body-centered action. So taking a map and turning it into an action. Okay, so I'm gonna start out by talking a little bit about parts of your brain that might be important for helping do exactly that, take that map and turn it into an action. Um, so this is just an, a rough outline of some of the things I'm gonna to cover today, um, very briefly touch on, especially the first few points and spend a little more time on the, on the last two points at the bottom here. Um, these are really hypotheses, but I'm not very good at getting my hypotheses quite right. So to keep it simple, I'm going to tell you where we ended up, um, which is usually in the ballpark of my hypothesis, but I'm, I'm often uh, not quite spot on there. So I'm going to keep it more phrase oriented in terms of my outline here. So I'm going to talk about parietal cortex and how that might be important for doing what I was just talking about, translating out for the appropriate action. So to study this, we um, use the task where the animals have to learn um, a, a, basically a set of action sequences. Um, and the way this task works basically is we have many cues around the periphery of our maze and we turn one of them on and our little rat here has to learn how to locate that cue and then run to that spot and get a reward. And so what you'll see if you look at individual trials over here on the right is things like this, right? Sometimes the rat will run relatively straight, other times it'll take more of a curved route to get to that goal. And so we did this to look at activity patterns in the brain while the animal's doing these action sequences, right? And what we found is that if you look at single cells, we could well isolate single brain cells and look at their activity patterns. If you look at all the single cells that are in the neighborhood of one of our recording elements, you'd see that many different cells were encoding many different things. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that today. I'm gonna to skip to the second part, which is one of the things we also did was to look at the collective activity of all of the cells in the neighborhood of a recording element and look to see if there's encoding at that level. And we were a little surprised to find that there was. So even though all these single cells are doing many, many different things, there's hidden in that, that um, ensemble of cell activity is some interesting patterns. And one of them you can almost see with just the raw data I'm showing you over here on the right, is that if you looked next to some recording elements, you found that the population of cells tended to be more active. These red dots are showing you active cells when the animal is running straight. And you found other next to a different recording element, slightly different spot in the brain, you might see one that was more active when the animal is turning left or a different one when the animal is turning right. Okay. And what we did also was we would position our recording elements, you see these lines are showing you one of those, at different depths within the cortex, this outer covering here of the, of the brain. And we would, over the course of our experiment, advance some of those electrodes down through the depth of the brain as well, okay? And this is some of what we found. I'm just gonna give you a little piece of this story today. If you take a new map, um, the animal's action states, that's what this little graph over here is basically showing you. Um, and so each little square here is a particular action state. If you start at the bottom middle, that would be no movement at all, right here, just above my zero. As you move to the left, that's a left turn. And as you move to the right, that's turning right. And the further you are to the right or the left, the faster you're turning left or right. And then as you move up this plot here towards the top, that's straightforward motion. So at the very top in the middle would be going perfectly straightforward really fast, for example, okay? And what we did is we would always run our animals through at least um, two of these sessions where we were recording um, brain activity while they're doing this. And then we could look to see if there were patterns in, in um, their motion state with respect to a particular recording element. And you can see that there were. So this is a recording element where, where the population of cells was more active when the animal was going straight forward. Um, and that was consistent across those two sessions. 
And what we what really surprised us is when we looked across all of our recording elements in the brain of all of our animals, we found that almost all of those, um, almost every recording element was finding this kind of pattern in the neighborhood. So this is, if you look at the blue bars here, basically um, everything above this little kind of red gray area is um, cells that met our criteria, are pretty tough criteria for encoding in that state. And you can see that almost all of the cell, almost all of the um, modules or chunks of tissue um, we were recording from had those kind of activity patterns present in them. So it seemed to be a pretty pervasive thing um, for this part of the brain. Um, and seeing that many things doing the same thing in the brain is pretty unusual, at least for us. We were a little surprised by that. Um, I accidentally cut a slide. Whoops. <laughs> um, there's supposed to be one more slide showing you that the uh, <laughs> across depth this, this encoding is, is maintained. So if you follow this encoding, if you find a cell that's encoding straight, or if you find a region of tissue that's encoding straightforward motion, it continues to do that all the way across depth. Um, and there's same thing for, for encoding of right turns or left turns, whatever encoding you find on the surface, that encoding stays consistent across depth as well. My apologies for that. And then the last thing um, that we looked at for this is just to say if these, if these patterns are meaningful, you should be able to take the brain activity and use that to predict behavior. And that's what we're doing here. So what you, we basically did is we used half one of those sessions to build a model of the brain activity for all the recording elements and use that model then to predict what's the current motion state of the animal. And each, um, we basically converted that into a single number and this is plotted on the vertical axis here. And then we look to see, um, once we predicted that number, we, used, we then applied that data to the new data set where we were blind, where we kept the, the model at least blind to what the animal was actually doing, and then use that to test our model and see how well it was working. And if you compare the blue and the red lines, the true versus the reconstructed um, motion state of the animal, you can see this model was actually highly accurate at predicting what the animal is doing. So this encoding does seem to be meaningful and does seem to be very well connected and, and predictive of behavior. Okay. So that we took to, to suggest that parietal cortex would be well positioned to be that um, the, the critical interface for taking um, um, information in, in world-centered coordinates and moving it into um, this, this egocentric action. Um, one of the reasons we thought that I didn't have time to go into is that parietal cortex has a little bit of that world-centered map-like information um, present in it as well. So next I'm gonna talk about um, another brain region, the hippocampus and putting that together with the parietal cortex and, and really kind of building up this idea that this, this transformation is happening across that set of brain regions. So I'm gonna come back to this problem I introduced you to a little bit earlier um, that where you have to take knowledge of, of where you are in the city and very much map-like coordinates and turn that into an appropriate action. So we found a way to ask rats to do that, basically. <laughs> Not a very easy thing to ask a rat, but we figured out how to, how to do our best approximation of that. And that's what this uh, task is here. So I'm gonna, just for simplicity, I'm gonna call this our map to action task. So the way this task works is you teach rats to navigate um, th to a series of locations. And they start at location one, go to two, and then on to three. And then where it gets a little tricky is they then will go on to four, and then back to one, and then to two again, and then to three again. But this time they have to go to five to get rewarded, back to one, and then right back through the sequence. So what the animals have to basically do is keep track of where they are in that, in that um, you know, navigating their ma that map of the environment, and convert out the appropriate action when they get to zone three here to go over to the four or over to five, okay? And we um, train animals to do that from memory. So they have to visit these um, locations very quickly in order to get rewarded. Um, and then we compare running these trials from memory to running these trials and animals queued through the sequence. So again, in that case, you'd be doing the same thing, but you wouldn't really need to access a map or turn it into an action. And then one other little piece that's useful, I'll refer to very briefly, is at least one of those zones, all the animal has to do is remember to go to a particular place. So if they're coming from four or coming from five, they just need to go to place one. So that's a very simple, almost map-like only um, trial for the animals to run. 
You can see that if you look at these path plots here, animals can get pretty good at doing that. They're making some errors, obviously, but um, considering how difficult that task is, they're doing a pretty good job. And uh, skip this over, over this because our uh, picture was over here, but this is the work of um, a graduate student in my lab, Christine Simmons, who's done this work. So we would train these animals to criterion of at least 70% correct on that hard four versus five choice. And then we would um, try and activating the parietal cortex um, to see what happened. So getting back at that same idea. And what we found is that if you inactivate the parietal cortex, animals become very impaired at making that four versus five choice. So on the left here, you infuse animals with saline, so with no drug um, in parietal cortex while they're running this task, they remain pretty good at doing what they learn how to do, right? Going to four versus five. But if you put in an, uh, an activating agent known as mucimol into parietal cortex, so turn off parietal cortex, while animals are running that task, they become very impaired um, at the task, they have many more incorrect than correct trials now. Um, so again, really driving home this idea that parietal cortex might be important for translating out that action. And then what I didn't show you here, but was also true is that on those Q trials, these animals without parietal cortex on board were not impaired. Okay, I think this is wrapping up this end of the story before we move into to what goes wrong in disease. Um, so the last thing I want to do is to, as I mentioned at the beginning here, pull in that other brain region, the one that tends to map an allocentric coordinates, the hippocampus, and look to see if what it might be doing in this particular task is providing that allocentric information the animal needs to be able to convert out the appropriate action. And so what these little pie charts are showing you is, again, us doing that same thing I talked about earlier with parietal cortex, but now with some different brain regions and different information where we're trying to build an activity pattern, um, understand the activity patterns in the brain and how those can be used to predict behavior. And this time the behavior we're trying to predict is um, it, whether the animal is gonna make an accurate choice, they're gonna go to the correct zone or make an inaccurate choice. And if our, um, um, right, so um, sorry, green, <laughs> green is, is accurate decoding. So if our model was successful and the gray shades are if our model failed. And then what we're doing is comparing that both for when the animal was gonna make a correct or an incorrect choice. So can we both predict when the animal is gonna do the right thing and also predict when the animal is gonna make a mistake? And so what you can see is if you use hippocampal data um, to, to build your model, um, that, that data is pretty good at predicting what, what allocentric context the animal came from. Did the animal come from four or did it come from five? Parietal cortex is not so good at doing that. So the green lines now add up to something pretty close to the chance, whereas hippocampus, if you add those two green areas up, is pretty well above chance. So that's suggesting that that allocentric information might be encoded or present in hippocampus. And then next, if you look at parietal cortex and the animal's getting ready to make that choice, the left versus right choice, now you can see if you use parietal cortex data to build your model of what the animal's gonna do, go to four versus go to five, parietal cortex is pretty good at predicting both correct and error trials. Hippocampus, it's not awful, but not well above chance, not doing as significant, not doing as well as parietal cortex is doing. And then last, if we compare to those cued trials I was telling you about earlier, you can see that on cued trials, neither parietal cortex or hippocampus are very good at predicting what the animal is going to do. Okay, they're both performing around chance. So again, they seem to these brain regions seem to be important for different aspects of that solving that problem, taking a map and turning it into an action. Okay, right, and I already covered that. Okay, so good. Um, that leaves me plenty of time to now switch gears a little bit and talk about what's happening in the same brain network, but in the context of disease, in, the, in this case, Alzheimer's disease. So I'm gonna start telling you a little bit about navigation and what's happening with respect to navigation. And then I'm gonna switch and end talking about um, what I promised with my title, um, how sleep and building memories during sleep may actually be um, one of the critical drivers of, of failures to, to navigate your environment, okay? So you probably, this audience probably knows a bit about Alzheimer's disease, but I'll give you a brief introduction. Um, so Alzheimer's disease affects a lot of people, no matter how you measure that, whether you're measuring that in terms of the exactly people who are affected, or if you're measuring that in terms of those people and their caregivers who are spending time taking care of them, or medical costs, no matter how you add it up, it 
the, the effect of Alzheimer's disease in our population is very pervasive and it just seems to be getting uh, bigger. Um, and Alzheimer's disease involves kind of some hallmark um, pathological features, if you will. And there's kind of two key hallmark features of Alzheimer's disease. One is accumulation of amyloid beta. It's cleaved from a larger protein known as APP, amyloid precursor protein. And the other is uh, um, an, a, something that's associated with microtubules. So basically, so the skeleton of a nerve cell known as tau, um, an abnormal aggregation of that product, um, a phosphorylated form of this tau. And so what happens, um, kind of the key hallmark features is that you get enough aggregation of these two products, amyloid beta and tau, that you start getting amyloid beta plaques, these large extracellular deposits of amyloid beta, and then tau tangles. So again, extracellular um, deposits of, of lots of tau aggregated together, basically. Um, so those are the two key features of Alzheimer's disease. But what's interesting is that those two things start to accumulate, both amyloid beta and tau, well before you start seeing the cognitive changes that are used to diagnose or predict when someone is actually starting to develop Alzheimer's disease. There's some debate about how far apart those two processes um, happen. Some of the more recent models suggest that A beta and tau are a little bit closer together. And then the last point that's interesting is that even though A beta is coming first and getting a lot of attention because it's the, one of the first things that starts to accumulate and one is a hallmark feature of the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, for some reason, tau seems to be better at predicting dysfunction in terms of behavioral impairments. Um, so there's still a lot we're trying to understand about how that happens or why that progression happens in that way. Um, okay, I think that was all I was gonna say here. So we got interested in Alzheimer's disease because one of the first things or one of the first symptoms people often report with Alzheimer's disease, if you're a human um, patient who's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, for example, is getting lost um, and not just getting lost, but particularly getting lost in newer surroundings. Um, and that was pretty interesting to us because of what we study. I'll try and flush out why that is as we go along here. Um, and that's not just true of humans with Alzheimer's disease. If you look at mice um, or uh, rodents, other rodents, even rat models of Alzheimer's disease, one pervasive feature in those models is that they also have problems navigating. Um, the precise cause of that impaired navigation I would say was, I would say still is a little bit unclear. I think that I'll talk about some possible causes of that as we go through here. I don't think we have a clear answer as to what exactly is the cause um, of that. So we got interested in modeling in rodents, um, kind of that condition in humans where they tend to have problems navigating their surroundings. So we set up to develop a task that kind of mimic those conditions where humans tend to have trouble getting lost in new surroundings. And we, to do that, we took advantage of a task that had been used to study aging um, in rats actually, and we adapted it for, for our mouse model of Alzheimer's disease we were looking at. Um, most of the day, I'm gonna, we used about three different models in my lab. Most of the data I'm going to tell you about today is this um, triple, yeah, about three, is this triple transgenic mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, which aggregates A beta um, from APP and also aggregates um, tau as well. Um, the way it's doing that isn't the cleanest way in the world because it's using, it's taking advantage of some of the genes that we've discovered from familial Alzheimer's disease, um, which is the less common form of Alzheimer's disease to get this aggregation to happen. So it's not a bad model of the aggregation, but it's not certainly not a perfect model of Alzheimer's disease, like, like most um, rodent models of human conditions. Um, okay, so what do we do or how does this task work? So the short answer for what we did is we basically would get mice lost over and over again and ask them to learn how to use their surroundings to figure out where they were, right? So kind of a mean thing to do, but uh, we tried to make it fun when they did a good job of it. So hopefully that trade that trade off paid off for them. Okay, so the way this task works is we teach our mouse to run down to the end of this track to this barrier and back inside this enclosed start box to get a um, water reward. So we water deprive these animals and off they're thirsty, teach them to run back and forth to get a water reward. So that creates a nice baseline of movement. And um, then what we do is we add a second element to this task once they get pretty good at doing that. And that is we also have the ability to deliver a, a rewarding stimulation directly to your reward center in your brain, those dopamine pathways that are kind of the critical um, pathways for all things rewarding. 
And that makes the animals really want to get that reward. And what we do is we make the ability to get that pretty hard. So there's this reward zone I've marked for you on the track right here. It's actually positioned in the room and it's really only marked in our camera. So there's no way for the animal to see where that spot is. And what's, what makes it hard for that animal to locate that is what we do between each trial is we slide that track while the animal's consuming its water reward, it's very slow below its vestibular threshold, to a new location in the room. And so every trial starts at some randomly pre-selected position in the room and the animal has to learn how to run to that reward spot and initially stay there for a short period of time. But as the training goes on, we ask them to show more and more confidence and stay there for a longer period of time to get that reward. The shorter periods at the beginning of the task also um, allow the animal to learn the task because it can get that reward by accident initially. You might be a little worried about that barrier versus these distal cues we're using in the room for the animal to get oriented, but we put that black barrier on a black background and we do some testing afterwards to make sure the animal's not using the barrier to solve the task. So we've gotten around that issue that way. And just to be safe, we check each time to make sure that animal isn't cheating and using that barrier. So it seems to, they seem to really use those distal cues to figure out where they are in this space. Okay. So this is um, work from another graduate student in my lab, Alina Stimmel. And um, this is how the, this is what the data looks like from that um, task I was just telling you about. So if you start in the upper left corner here, this is just an example um, of a velocity um, profile. So the speed of the animal um, for a control mouse running this task. And this is data from one of those difficulty levels, a 2.0 second difficulty level. And I'll tell you what that means in a second. And um, what you can see here is the animal, it's all plotted left to right as the track. Um, zero is the center of that re blue reward zone. I marked it again for you in blue here. And I'll come back to what the orange means in a second. So negative would be to the left of the reward zone, positive to the right. So what you can see is that as the animal leaves that start box, it initially moves with a higher velocity and then it slows down because it needs to stop and remain in that reward zone to get rewarded before getting its reward and then proceeding to the end of the track. I'm only showing you the outward bound data here, not the returns. Okay, so that's what the data looks like for a control animal. And what we then did is we asked if we took the data from that um, area just in front of the reward zone, marked in orange, to look for the animal slowing down in anticipation of that reward zone. And we did that for each of the difficulties we use, plotted in the bottom right corner here is these different delay levels um, for this task. And so what the animal does, what the animal does is it starts with this early easiest delay, the 0.5, and works up to 2.5 over the course of training. And at that easier delay, where they only have to remain in that reward zone for half a second, they can get those rewards by accident sometimes. It starts to happen a little bit less at one, and then it starts to get pretty hard to by accident get rewarded once you get to 1.5, 2, and so on. And what you can see is control animals do a pretty good job of really dropping their velocity in that reward zone as the task gets harder. And our Alzheimer's disease mouse model does not. So they're, again, they're significantly worse at slowing down in that reward zone. You can see the data plotted across all, you can see that in this data plotted across all reward delays. And then if you look over on the right at these two graphs here, these are data within one of the reward data delays, but plotted across the full track. So you can really appreciate what's happening there as well. And again, same kind of a pattern. You can see that the, um, as shown in red, the Alzheimer's disease mice are doing a bad job of slowing down anticipation into that reward zone. Same thing at another delay, a bit more difficult delay, so on and so forth. So all of this data was from, from relatively young female mice. Um, we tried the same thing in, our, in male mice, and they were not impaired at this task. This is specific to our female mice. And what we then wanted to do next was now take a look at the brains of these same animals and see if any of those pathology, pathology features I was telling you about earlier were explaining um, what we were seeing in terms of behavior. Okay, so as I already mentioned, we were looking pretty early in these mice. And so what I'm showing you first over here on the left, each of these green dots is um, a pathology, is one of those A-beta plaques I was telling you about. And you can see in, the, in some of our older male mice, some plaques have started to form. And the female mice I was just showing you, there really aren't any plaques yet, um, maybe one here and there um, in the brains of the mice um, at that age. Okay. Um, and all of these histology images I'm going to show you next are the same basic set of colors where 
Um, you might, you can't see it in this image, but there, sometimes there is some blue, which is a neuron that's not, which is um, anything with a nucleus. And what you're seeing over here are some reds. This is any, the red is any neuron um, um, in the brain. And then um, green is gonna always be our pathology marker. Okay, so this is showing you data from a different stain now over on the right. This is an a, another A beta stain, but one that really looks for A beta anywhere, whether it's formed a plaque yet or not. And so what you can do, use this stain to do is look and see when A beta is starting to accumulate before, um, potentially even before plaques have formed. And I'm showing you this data for all those brain regions in that plot I was showing you earlier. I'm not gonna go through each of them one at a time because it's not really important for what we're talking about today. But you can also see that the older male mice in particular have a lot more pathology than the, the female mice or younger male mice, okay? And um, what you're seeing again is just build up often inside of cells of A beta. The, you can see some green mixed in with the red if you look at the zoomed in image over here. So that's what we're looking at or quantifying. So A beta, it turns out, as, as I, you might guess from what I told you earlier, isn't terribly good at predicting the animal's behavior. Um, but if you look at um, that other marker I told you about, tau, it does a little better job. And what got interesting there too is where um, that tau was that was good at predicting behavior. So we did the same thing I was telling you about with A beta, but now with tau. So green is accumulation of tau. The red is neurons. Blue is uh, non-neuronal non cell. Okay, so things like glia. And if you look at this data now, and if you try to look at each brain region one at a time and see if any one of those brain regions in that parietal hippocampal network is predictive of behavior, you found that for one part of the task, for one brain region, you got some good prediction, okay? But what's interesting, what seems to be even better at predicting is not looking at a single brain region by itself, but looking at the profile of standing across a set of brain regions. So that's what this is showing you over here. And what you can see or what really stood out was interesting is the, the set of brain regions that was best at predicting um, that um, the animal's behavior on the task was really the, the, some of those cortical regions. So re parietal cortex, retrosplenial cortex, and some other parahippocampal cortical regions. Okay, those are the ones that are green over here on the right. And I should mention also, this is in collaboration with Wei Wu in statistics and one of his graduate students, the Shen, um, who helped us develop the, who really came up with the idea for the approach to um, measure that profile across brain regions using something called independent components analysis, um, a signal detection theory um, um, approach. Okay. So now what I've told you so far is about this parietal hippocampal network that seems to be important for, um, for interfacing between maps and action. I've talked about how parts of that same brain network are good at predicting that our animal um, analogous tasks to, to what's seen in humans with Alzheimer's, getting, getting oriented or getting lost in new surroundings. And then the last I'm gonna talk about that other piece I haven't mentioned or gotten to yet, um, the um, looking at some of these brain, same brain regions, but during sleep. And we think that's important for memory. I'll tell you about why that is next. So I promised to tell you that about how these navigation impairments, the precise cause isn't unclear. So the reason for that is there's a couple things, at least a few different things, and probably more than I don't have on my list here, that could be leading to those navigation impairments, right? So it could be that the navigation systems in the brain or the navigation computer in your brain or however you want to think of it is failing on some level, right? So it could be a navigational failure. But as I mentioned before, navigating is inextricably linked to learning and memory. So it could actually be that those are memory impairments and not pure navigation impairments. Or the data from my lab seems to suggest it's probably a mixture of both. So I wanted to switch gears and talk about the memory piece of this next. So some of the evidence for this being a memory problem and not just a navigation problem came from a study done in 2005 out of UC Irvine. And what they found looking at the same mouse model, if you look at, just look at the green circles here, you don't really need to even look at the other ones to see what I'm describing. What they did is they plotted their data for within a day. So each circle with, that's grouped together is data, a data point within a day on a spatial navigation task. And then they then compared what happened when you looked at the beginning of the next day to the end of the previous day. And what you can see is there's always a big jump, right? So the animals are forgetting, they're performing more poorly 
from one day to the next, even though the within a day learning looks a little bit normal, right? The this, this slopes of these lines within a day don't look terribly off. But what seems to really be happening for those Alzheimer's mice is they're, lose, they're not starting at the same point the next day, they're forgetting compared to other mice, okay? So that got us interested in memory. And then there's another thing known about Alzheimer's disease that got us interested in a, in a particular um, way for building memories and that way is that it happens during sleep. So um, memory and sleep are pretty well linked together. There's quite a bit of literature looking at that. I'm gonna skip over that. Memory and sleep are also all linked in the context of Alzheimer's disease. So what I'm showing you down here is the amount of a beta accumulation in the brain is predictive of a particular aspect of your sleep that's thought to be important for memory, known as slow wave sleep. And again, more A beta, less slow wave sleep, or the poorer maybe is a better way to put it, your slow wave sleep is. And then slow wave sleep has been linked to hippocampal activation, that same brain region I was telling you about. We'll come back to its role in memory in a second. And then as you might guess from what I just told you, that hippocampal activation is also linked to memory performance. And so there's not a direct link from A beta, for example, to impaired memory or even A beta to hippocampal activation, but there's links along the way. So A beta predicts slow wave activity, slow wave activity predicts the amount of hippocampal activation, and then hippocampal activation predicts your memory performance. So we wanted to dive in and take a little deeper look at this idea. And what we wanted to look at is based on this idea that one thing that happens during sleep in re relation to memories is that your brain will repeat activity patterns representing behaviors you did that day. So one example of that is the hippocampus that encodes um, in places in map-like coordinates will, fire, will repeat an activity pattern representing a series of places you visited while you're sleeping, okay? Um, and hippocampus hasn't just been linked to those things. It's also been linked to being critical for episodic memory. If you look at humans who've had injury to the hippocampus, for example, so episodic memory is remembering the sequence of events that make up your day. Um, and then hippocampus doesn't seem to be doing this building of new episodic memories or learning new information by itself. It seems to do that in coordination with cortex. And one of the cortical regions it coordinates with is parietal cortex. Okay, and so the way um, that piece works is, or at least the theory for how this piece works, there's a decent amount of evidence for this theory now at this point, although some of the details are still a little bit debated. Um, the idea here is that what hippocampus might be doing while you're sleeping is taking cortical representations of different aspects of a memory and linking them together. So if you're remembering back on the sight, taste, smell, and sound of being at your favorite restaurant yesterday for your lunch, um, there's, there's many color-coded aspect, color-coded here for simplicity aspects of that memory that hippocampus is thought to be linking together. And what's thought to happen is when you sleep and your brain is playing back those activity patterns, it actually even does so at high speed or in fast forward, which we think is important for building those connections as well. Um, hippocampus is helping to link those things together. The, where the debate comes in is if hippocampus does this for all of your life or if eventually you don't need hippocampus and cortex can kind of do it on its own once you've had enough iterations of this. Luckily, that debate is, is not critical for the studies I'm going to tell you about. So it, for us, it doesn't really matter on those details. Okay, so we got interested in looking at our those that same young female mouse model doing the same task I was just telling you about. The only difference is this time the animals were doing a virtual version of that task. Um, that's because the, we can get our mice to run a lot more trials on the virtual version. And for the data I'm going to tell you about, having lots of trials is very helpful. So same basic task, we're having animals to run. The only difference is they were doing a task session in the sandwiched in the middle here. And just before that task, the animals would have a rest session. And then just after, they would have another rest session. So what those two rest sessions allow you to do is look for hardwired connections in the brain and then look to see what's changing. Is the animals playing back new patterns or is it, or are you just seeing re-emergence of the same hardwired patterns? So you can use that pre-task is what I'm saying is basically a control for, for um, activity patterns arising from the task the animal did that day. And what we do is we basically build templates of what those activity patterns look like. Um, so this is just showing you one of those activity patterns we recorded as the animal approaches that reward zone. And then we can look for those templates being repeated when the animals are sleeping. Okay. 
So um, first, start with the behavior. Um, you can see that when animals run this virtual version of the maze, this is just showing you the control animals at three different points in the task. They get pretty good at slowing down in that reward zone, again, marked in blue, right? So running to the track, stopping in the reward zone, marked for your purposes in blue, not marked for the animal. Um, now, if you look at transgenic animals shown in black, and the controls are shown in gold here, um, you can see they do not slow. Their, their speed is faster in that reward zone compared to the control animals, right? So they're, again, impaired at the same task. That's good. We can repeat what we did with a different task. And so now I'm going to talk about looking at the brains of these same animals when they're sleeping just before and after that task. Okay. So what we did is we recorded something basically like an EEG, but in, recorded from inside the brain. So it gives you the ability to do a few more things with that um, potential. And we use that to classify the animal's sleep stages. If I taught you how to read this, you could probably do it yourself too. We actually use a computer to do it, so we, we're unbiased. Um, but you can see at least three different things on here. So the black is showing you if the animal's moving or not, and the colors are showing you different um, frequency bands in the brain, okay? And what you can see is at least three patterns. The animal's moving and awake, when the black is up, not much in, those, in this area of the plot here. You can see a second pattern right here where you see a bright color, meaning um, higher activity in that frequency range. That's a frequency range known as theta, um, but low movement, and that's REM sleep. That's what REM sleep looks like. So that's a REM sleep episode there. And then just before that, you can see low theta power and low movement, and that would be one of those slow wave sleep episodes. Humans have a few more um, sleep stages within that realm of slow wave sleep that they get classified into. In rodents, we mostly stick to those two stages, although some people are trying to push that a little more recently. So th those are the two stages I'll talk about today. And in fact, I'm going to focus just on the slow wave sleep. So one of the um, one of the ways you can look at those reactivation events or replay of experience events is just to use a population marker that tends to coincide with them. So that population marker is known as a sharp wave ripple in the hippocampus. So this, that's what I'm showing you right here, is just our detection of this um, high amplitude event here, known as a sharp wave ripple on a particular frequency range in your hippocampus. So we would look at those events, and we would compare them to other events in different parts of the brain. So in cortex, in the parietal cortex, for example, there's a different event known as a spindle, just a different frequency range that is also associated with those reactivation events, but it's in cortex. And then, as I already mentioned, one of the things we look at is a slow wave, and one hallmark of that slow wave is uh, something I'm going to call a delta wave trough, or DWT, but it's basically, it's also known as a downstate or an absence period of activity. And what happens in cortex is you'll have these downstates with low activity, um, paired with upstates or high activity. And it's the transition between those low and high activity states when you tend to see reactivation events and when you tend to see those cortical spindles, okay? And so what we wanted to do was use these events to look at interactions across brain regions, right? It's hard to record enough single cells in every one of those brain regions at the same time to look at single cells, but you can look at these population events to get at the same idea. Our first surprise when we did this study was that when we just started out by looking at sleep itself. Um, and what we found was opposite what we would have expected. So if you compare a non-transgenic animal still in gold and our um, Alzheimer's animals in black still, what we found is that the transgenic animals or Alzheimer's disease young female mice were actually still more and they had more, um, they had longer slow wave sleep episodes. So when they went into a bout of slow wave sleep, it lasted significantly longer and they were still more. This, as you'll see in a second, looks a little bit like compensation of some sort. Okay, so now if we measure those three events I was just talking about, those delta wave troughs, sharp wave ripples, and spindles, and look at them on our animals, I'm just going to focus in on these one at a time, so I'm going to start with the delta waves. You can see they weren't, the density of those events wasn't terribly different in our control in our transgenic animals, and as a result, the density being pretty similar, um, the number of delta wave events was also pretty similar. Okay, a little different story though if you look at the other events. So now if you focus in on sharp wave ripples, you can see those are the density of sharp wave ripples. That's the hippocampal 
reactivation event is significantly reduced. But remember, there was increased slow wave sleep. So that decrease in sharp wave ripple density was canceled out so that the total number of sharp wave ripple events was not significantly different. So it's almost like those transgenic mice are trying to make up for that, that lower density. Okay, similar picture if you look at cortical spindles. Again, the density is significantly reduced in your Alzheimer's mice, but same, same story because of that increase in slow wave sleep episode length they actually end up with a not significantly different, it looks almost even higher, but it's not significantly different um, um, number, total number of spindles, right? So lower density compensated by more sleep, equal number. All right, so what we were actually after was none of that, <laughs> but we'll get there as well. We're actually interested in interactions between those two brain regions, interactions between parietal cortex and hippocampus. And one way you can do that is a fancy cross correlation, if you will, where you look at the occurrence of sharp wave ripples plotted as bar plots here, centered around each delta wave trough. So zero is the, the middle of that delta wave trough, and these bars are showing you when that sharp wave ripple happened with respect to that delta wave trough. What you can see is in control animals, those sharp wave ripples tend to happen right before the delta wave trough. It's not entirely surprising that that was already known. And what's interesting is that in control animals, the syncing up of those two events in hippocampus and parietal cortex tends to increase after the animals ran our task. Um, as you see here, showing as a, this is kind of an extreme example where they increased a lot. And what you can then do is take all of your data and say, did that happen? Did you get an increase in syncing up between parietal cortex and hippocampus after the animals ran the task? And you can see most of the time you did, sometimes we did not, but well above chance you did in control animals, but not in transgenic animals. That sinking seemed to have been disrupted, even though they were in some ways compensating for the events themselves, the sinking of the events was still disrupted. And what makes that particularly interesting is if you look in control animals, how strongly, how strong that increase happens. So the more sinking up there is, after the animal runs the task, the better they do on the task the following day. So it's as if they're doing a better job of building those memories. And as a result, the next day they do better at, a ta at the task. That's what happens in control animals. In transgenic animals, that pattern is, is absent. So again, not just the sinking, but the connection to the behavior also seems to have been disrupted. Um, I'm gonna skip this part for time because I'm running out of time here, um, but I'm just gonna, just tell you briefly, we also wanted to look at those cortical spindles I was telling you about, because they're pretty well correlated with sharp wave ripples and the advantage of spindles, you can actually measure those in humans using an EEG, so nothing invasive at all while they're sleeping. So you could actually use this to translate our findings into humans as well. We saw some similar things there that I'm gonna skip over for time, apologies for that. And we also looked at those playing back of those activity patterns themselves within parietal cortex. And I'm gonna again, again, again skip pretty quickly over this so I can at least talk about some hope for the future with the last part of my talk to finish up here. Again, the, that, that event was not terribly impaired in our transgenic animals. They were relatively normal looking. Okay, so what about this? Can we do anything to fix it? And I think so we're getting some signs that there is some hope for fixing this event. Um, we didn't come up with the approach for fixing this. this I think somebody else came up with it. And I'm, they, I, don't, I don't know if I've heard the full story on this, but my guess is they found it by accident. When you hear the story, I think you'll see why I think that. Um, so what they this lab did in um, a little place called MIT um, out, out in the Northeast here, um, sorry, joke. Um, what this lab did is they figured out that um, AD mice, and they weren't the first to figure this out, this is actually already kind of known at the time, are missing a particular brain uh, rhythm, a 40 hertz brain rhythm. It's dysfunctional in AD mice, and pretty universally for, for many um, AD mouse models. And so they thought, let's go in and let's, I'm guessing what they thought, they thought let's go in and replace that missing um, 40 hertz activity, and let's just do that in hippocampus and see what that does specifically. And they also came up with a creative approach to use a non-invasive visual or multi-sensory stimulation to increase 40 hertz rhythm in many, many other parts of the brain. 
And what they found is that doing that didn't just replace the missing rhythm or, or fix the memory that they were probably after fixing initially, it also cleared A, beta, and tau. So it got rid of some of that pathology. And what they were able to figure out so far from mechanism is it seems to be doing this by taking advantage of the good inflammatory response. So getting your immune system to basically clear out some of this garbage um, that needs to be removed using either microglia. And then more recently, they've also shown astrocytes. So again, two kinds of glial cells in your brain um, seem to be important for, for driving that clearance. And so we wanted to see if we could use that same approach, starting just with hippocampus and then moving later into more um, clearing across other brain regions. So we repeated what they did, basically. We used a fancy approach called optogenetics to hijack a all the, all the neurons in, in hippocampus by taking over a small population of cells that controls everybody else. And so we use that to drive a 40 Hertz rhythm in hippocampus. And we would do that in this context of the same experiment I just told you about. We would just do that 40 Hertz clearance after the animals were on the task each day in order to not mess up the same day. So we did it at the end. So it wouldn't have a big effect on, on behavior right afterwards. Still um, work by Danielle, it's, that's in preparation. And I'm just gonna tell you about one little piece of what she's found. She's looked at all those same things I was just telling you about. And one thing that's, that gives us some hope here is that it, just doing that in hippocampus alone is pretty good at restoring that um, interaction between delta waves and cortex and, and sharp wave ripples in hippocampus. So that hippocampal cortical sinking seems to be completely restored in AD mice as long as you drive them um, at 40 Hertz for an hour a day after each of those task sessions. Okay, so um, it's not clear if this fixes everything. And that's the, the, un the part that's not fully clear to us yet is what I'm skipping over for now as Danielle tries to finish up that work and figure out the rest of that story. Um, so we, you, what, what that means is you might need to bring in some of those other brain regions and clear pathology there too, or something else entirely might be going on um, in those cases too. We'll see how that the rest of that story pans out. Just to wrap up with a little summary and then one more little teaser for where we're going all this, and then I'll leave a couple of minutes, hopefully for questions. Sorry about taking too much of your time here. Um, so what I've told you so far is that profile of tau pathology across the parietal hippocampal network seems to be an important predictor of being able to, to get oriented in new surroundings for our female AD mice. And um, is not just a navigation deficit, although that certainly might be part of it. It seems to be there's also some dysfunctional um, brain dynamics, if you will, during sleep, sinking between parietal cortex and hippocampus after the animals run that task. It seems to be driving some of that dysfunction and navigation. And you can at least partially rescue those problems um, by clearing some of the pathology just in hippocampus. Okay. So that is the summary we talked about. And then the teaser and why I started where I did about that whole egocentric, allocentric interactions is work that actually comes out of Danielle as well. Danielle found this nice little paper that's been around for a while. We just weren't aware of it until recently. Looking at humans and looking at this idea that it might not be egocentric impairments or allocentric impairments in navigation specifically. There's been some look at both in humans. For some reason in animals, everybody likes to focus on the allocentric. So we don't even have a good handle on the egocentric piece yet in animals. But their idea that I think they made a good case for and Danielle made also <laughs> might have been an even better case for when she described this to me, is this idea that it may be the interface between those two reference frames, that allocentric and that egocentric, that, that's the, the real deficit driving these nav navigational dysfunctions in Alzheimer's. So that's something we're interested in looking at in the future. All right. I don't have, if I go through all the names, here will be zero time for questions. I'll try and leave at least my last minute right here something for questions in case anybody has any. But obviously, many people were involved in this work. I uh, tried to highlight the undergraduate and graduate students that were involved with the point of getting names on papers for each of these projects and obviously other stuff going on we didn't have time to talk about today as well. And of course, thanks to the funding agencies that helped us get all this work done. Um, I'm going to stop there in case anybody has a couple questions. <laughs> thanks for your attention and time. Thanks so much, Aaron. Uh, very, very much appreciated. Um, we're, we're collecting some data now that suggests that memory does make an independent contribution in, um, a, this is a normal older adult sample where we were, uh, at, we had asked them about wayfinding difficulty. So there are questionnaires that can kind of look at that. 
And uh -huh. we also gave them an objective spatial orientation test. And then in a regression of format, we looked at the extent to which mem self-reported memory problems added significantly to the objective um, SOT test and yep. found that it did make a quite a significant um, difference in accounting for variance. And another variable which also seemed to have some um, predictive power was people reported not just on the, you know, their self-reported memory uh, difficulties, but also the severity of those difficulties and the extent to which they reported more severe memory problems also made an independent prediction, at least in, in one regression. And the third variable that was also a strong predictor, and I was going to ask my question based on, based on that, was uh, being female compared with male. I know you're running yeah. most of your mouse models in females, but there's a very strong difference, a uh, gender difference in, in humans uh, yeah. in terms of spatial orientation navigation. Yeah. So, um, why did you choose females? And have you looked at females and males? I mean, I think you showed us one study where you did look at it and males you didn't find much and females you did. Can you comment? Yeah. So, it's a very convoluted question, sorry. No, no, it's a good, it's a really good question. And you make a great point. Yeah, so we looked at males and females, two ages of males, two ages of females. We only saw the impairment in the females. So that's why everything else focused on the females after that. Um, and I'd love to say that connects to the gender differences seen in human Alzheimer's disease, but if you talk to most people in the field, and I, I agree with them, it's hard to know how well the sex difference in animal models really maps on to human Alzheimer's gender differences. If for nothing else, then your menopause seems to play a big role in some of the gender difference, or at least seems to be involved. The exact way it's involved is still debated and unclear in humans, um, but that's a piece that's usually not modeled in the, in the mouse models as well. So there definitely is a big sex difference, but that's probably something more to do with the genetics and probably of how these animals are made and probably less to do with uh, what, what's seen in humans, unfortunately. <laughs> so probably what we're seeing more there is really just a pathology difference. Now, back to the other part of your question, what you were saying about sex differences in navigation, for sure that's gonna play a role because you see this in, in animals as well as there are certainly are sex differences in, in navigation ability as well. So yeah, that's certainly playing a role. Um, we're just trying to, we're worrying less about the sex and the gender and more about the relationship between the pathology and what we're seeing. But yeah, very good points and, and good questions and, and stuff I'd love to look at more because I think it's very interesting. Thanks, other questions? What would you project being the eventual human outcomes applications? I work in a dementia care facility and most of the newer ones are of course designed in circular patterns so people can't get lost because eventually someday they'll get back to their room if they just keep walking in the correct direction. Um, and then you also have people like me where my husband gently tells me that I get lost if he turns me around three times in the bathroom. So I'm not very good during life pre-dementia either. So what would you forecast for people? Yeah, a couple points. Um, so for how we're thinking of our connections to the human field, two things. One, we're, we're trying to push earlier to try to find good ways to catch this earlier where you have a better chance of treating. So that's something I kind of skipped over at the beginning there. But the idea there is if we can really get a handle on what's going wrong in terms of cognition, then we can help do it, Neil do what he's doing, right? Finding a, a very quick and easy way to run a screening test to look to try and catch the disease earlier. So we're looking way before plaques and tangles, very early in the disease progression, these animals so early, it's almost controversial, like what exactly is going on at that point in time. Um, and so that's yes, what I would already be doomed if that was the case. <laughs> well, well, it depends. I, I would, I would be doomed too, because Elena is actually the best navigator in my lab. So <laughs> I agree. And then the other piece, the second piece is, is that treatment approach we we're talking about. So that's actually already in clinical trials. Um, and, um, the, the multi-sensory version of that, where you basically are playing lights and sounds back. Um, and the, the first paper came out of the clinical trials and that actually looks pretty promising as well for that being useful. So that's what we're interested too, is in how can we better understand these treatments? Um, and one 
I mean, we still don't know a lot about how those treatments work either, right? Like how often you have to do them? Do you get rebound? Do you, does the system stay down if you push it down with that 40 Hertz kind of mechanism or does it come back? What's the, you know, what are some of the key features to make that system work well as well? So we're also very interested in that. And then one thing too is um, like, what is the interaction between those kind of systems and sleep? It looks like um, just doing that 40 Hertz treatment is actually changing the sleep a little bit. And does that have implications for, for recovering the disease or the disorder? And if it does, can we, can we do a better job there as well? Um, so just kind of understand the basic relationship between that treatment approach and some of the things it's doing to the brain, um, for example, is, is another area we're trying to connect what we're doing to humans as well. Because I mean, people already, so that treatment people already doing on their home, one of my friends had somebody come and build a home 40 Hertz kit for their mom to, to, to use at home. So, I mean, you, yeah, so these things are already being done. Um, so the better, more we can get ahead of um, making, making it work better in the future, if it does pan out and work well, that's another area where we're kind of pushing things forward in my lab. But yeah, in terms of navigating, designing a navigation environment, which is probably where your question started. Yeah, that's a good question. What would you do to make it? I mean, <laughs> I, th I think the circular environment, I guess, isn't a terrible idea. And then things you can do to help. I mean, so it depends on what the issue is, right? If it turns out it is a translation issue, then that tells you one thing about designing the environment. If it's that only your allocentric memory is impaired and your egocentric is intact, you can use the egocentric compensation. So again, we're trying to understand the basics so that you can, so I can answer that question better. Cause I don't know if I have a good answer to that question yet. <laughs> Well, I do have people with a variety of dementias and the vascular people do not usually so much need direction every day as to where the dining room is, but yes. our Alzheimer's patients often do and also um, back to their rooms as well. And the mixed people actually seem to do the best. Um, I don't know if they're operating better off of environmental cues um, well, or what they're doing. The atypical dementia, is, it's just sort of hopeless all the way around. Um, everybody in the facility just participates in catching them and redirecting them to the correct locations. <laughs> but, right. Including when they're not your patients. Uh, uh, they're the ones that orbit regularly everywhere, um, including trying to go out the door. So yeah, I mean, um, I think for your patients that are doing the best, I'd be really curious how they're doing that. Like you said, I, I, I would predict that you're right. There's some sort of compensation that they're being pushed towards faster. And as a result, they're better able to compensate, is my guess. But yeah, that, that's very interesting. It, it is. It is interesting. There still does seem to be some ability to learn new information because there are clearly nobody's lived there before. And so yeah, they are able to eventually learn where they belong. Um, well, I just recently had a lady come back to the hospital after a, a near-death cardiac episode. And she just kept telling them in the hospital that she just needed to go back to her room. And as soon as she got back in the facility and was loud off of the trolley, she got and she went directly to her room. And so it was like, oh, oh However ischemic her brain got during that episode, it didn't get that part. <laughs> right, right, yeah. And I mean, I was thinking back to Neil's question too. Like I didn't show this data, but Alina, her initial thinking was it might just be navigational because Alina did with her task the same thing, looking at forgetting across days and the Alzheimer's mice. And for our task, we didn't really see that effect, that, that big memory deficit. Um, so, but there, from Danielle's data, there obviously is a memory piece there. Um, and the combination of those two data sets is what led me to feel like it's probably some of both um, in our in our mice at least some some of the navigation some of the navigation system being disrupted in some memory as well. But I yeah, know that's that's um, these are all very interesting questions. We're, we're running a little long, so um, people who have to move on, obviously, please do. Um, maybe we'll keep Aaron for just another question or two. Any further questions? I have lots, but I'll, I'll take them offline with Aaron. Thanks so much, Aaron. This was a, a wonderful presentation. Um, really appreciate your taking the time to fill us in on, uh, on your work. And uh, thank you all, everyone else, for coming today. Uh, we have